Hey everybody, uh, this is Mike, and I'm a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Um, and uh, after pondering recent conference talks and counsel from general authorities, along with my recent study of the war chapters in the Book of Mormon, I decided to put together some thoughts and prepare a plan for spiritual survival in the battle with sin. Now, this is only a summary of my notes and other materials that I've come across. And I strongly encourage you to read and study the war chapters of the Book of Mormon and look for specific examples that can help you in your spiritual battles. This presentation is titled Captain Moroni, War Strategy and the Battle with Sin, a Plan for Spiritual Survival. So we have been counseled most recently about surviving the attacks of the adversary by President Nelson, who said, the adversary is increasing his attacks on faith and upon us and our families at an exponential rate. To survive spiritually, we need counter strategies and proactive plans. And uh, more recently, um, he has said, we need to do better and be better because we are in a battle. The battle with sin is real. The adversary is quadrupling his efforts to disrupt testimonies and impede the work of the Lord. He is arming his minions with potent weapons to keep us from partaking of the joy and love of the Lord. So what is your battle? Elder L. Ray L. Christensen, in a talk titled The Sifting, has said, No person will ever be given more opposition than he has the potential to overcome or to endure. Some have a battle with infirmities, some with lust, some with addiction, some with envy or selfishness, some with sorrow. We need not fear the fiery darts of the adversary, because each of us has the power to avoid becoming entangled in sin more definitely than ever before. The time has come for each member of the church to keep close to the Lord, to be steadfast by sustaining and upholding and following the counsel of his divinely appointed servants, avoiding, as the Book of Mormon says, the vainness, the frailties, and the foolishness of men. We must purify our lives and sanctify our homes. We must teach our children to be loyal, obedient, honest, to respect the law and to appreciate protective laws, to have respect for all men and a love of the Lord and his church. We must live and act with courage, espouse and uphold God-given truth and principles because to follow, to follow the whims, enticements, and the faithless philosophy of men is to risk losing that which is most precious and desirable, peace, liberty, and salvation. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh unto God, and he will draw nigh unto you. The safe thing is still. Come, follow me. War seems so unrelatable, but here is how we can relate it to ourselves. Elder M. Russell Ballard has said, it seems clear to me that one of the most important things we can learn in this life is how to emphasize our eternal spiritual nature and control our evil desires. This should not be that difficult. After all, our spirit, which has been around a lot longer than our physical body, has already been successful in choosing righteousness over evil in the premortal realm. Before this earth was formed, we lived in the spirit world as sons and daughters of heavenly parents who loved us and continue to love us now. President David O. McKay said, man's earthly existence is but a test as to whether we will, he will concentrate his efforts, his mind, his soul upon things which contribute to the comfort and gratification of his physical nature 
or whether he will make as his life's purpose the acquisition of spiritual qualities. Mosiah chapter 3 verse 19 says, For the natural man is an enemy to God, and has been from the fall of Adam, and will be forever and ever, unless he yields to the enticings of the Holy Spirit, and putteth off the natural man, and becometh a saint through the atonement of Christ the Lord, and becometh as a child, submissive, meek, humble, patient, full of love, willing to submit to all things which the Lord seeth fit to inflict upon him, even as a child doth submit to his father. Now to better understand this spiritual battle we are facing, you must first know your identity. Elder Ballard, in a conference talk given in October 2019 titled, Giving Our Spirits Control Over Our Bodies, said, This is who you and I really are and who you have always been, a son or daughter of God, with spiritual roots in eternity and a future overflowing with infinite possibilities. You are first, foremost, and always a spiritual being. And so when we choose to put our carnal nature ahead of our spiritual nature, we are choosing something that is contrary to our real, true, authentic spiritual self. Still, there's no question that flesh and earthly impulses complicate the decision making. With a veil of forgetfulness drawn between the premortal spirit world and this mortal world, we can lose sight of our relationship to God and our spiritual nature. And our carnal nature can give priority to what we want right now. Learning to choose the things of the spirit over the things of the flesh is one of the primary reasons why this earthly experience is part of Heavenly Father's plan. It's also why the plan is built upon the solid, sure foundation of the atonement of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, so that our sins, including the errors we make when we yield to the flesh, can be overcome through constant repentant, repentance and we can live spiritually focused. Now, Elder Melvin J. Ballard described our new experiences coming to earth from our heavenly home. He said, when the first of the father's faithful sons and daughters were about to come into earth life, they were undoubtedly warned and cautioned, for we were to have two new experiences. First, we were to come into possession of a mortal tabernacle, never having had one before. It was all strange to us. We were charged that we were to take possession of that mortal tabernacle and make it our servant, and were to be master over it to honor it and yet subjugate it. Second, we were to be in the presence of the enemy who was now a majority. Another way to better prepare, to be better prepared for the spiritual battle we face is to know the enemy we are fighting. Abraham chapter two, verses 27 through 28 says, and the Lord said, whom shall I send? And one answered like unto the Son of Man, Here am I, send me. And another answered and said, Here am I, send me. And the Lord said, I will send the first. And the second was angry and kept not his first estate. And at that day, many followed after him. So a little background on um, the enemy. He was first known um, as Lucifer. And that name Lucifer means literally light bearer or shining one. Lucifer was a high ranking servant of the father. He was known throughout the entire heavens as an angel of God who was in authority in the presence of God. However, his rebellion required expulsion from the heavens above. His high position as a son of the morning helped him to start a war of opinion that divided Heavenly Father's children and resulted in the rebellion of one third of his family. He desired glory and honor for him and his own plan to eliminate the risk of failure in Heavenly Father's plan of salvation. And his plan would destroy our agency and opportunity to progress in this life. <clears throat> Moses chapter 4 tells us how Lucifer became Satan. In verses 3 through 4 it says, By the power of mine only begotten, I caused that he should be cast down. 
and he became Satan, yea, even the devil, the father of all lies, to deceive and to blind men, and to lead them captive at his will, even as many as would not hearken unto my voice. So, <clears throat> some of Satan's tactics that he has used uh, include his scheme, which failed in the premortal world, but he has not abandoned his plan. He seeks to lead us into sinful rebellion, and he seeks to win our devotion and adoration. Um, James R. Clark has said, There is no crime he would not commit, no debauchery he would not set up, no plague he would not send, no heart he would not break, no life he would not take, no soul he would not destroy. He comes as a thief in the night. He is a wolf in sheep's clothing. Now let's look at how big our opponent is that we are facing. Um, if we were to estimate the size of the enemy's army, um, we read in Doctrine and Covenants section 29 verse 36, And it came to pass that Adam, being tempted of the devil, for behold, the devil was before Adam, for he rebelled against me, saying, Give me thine honor, which is my power. And also a third part of the hosts of heaven turned he away from me because of their agency. So I, I did a little bit of uh, number crunching, as you can see here on this uh, slide. Um, I went to Google and uh, looked up um, the total uh, estimated population of, of people who have lived on, on the earth uh, to the present day and um, was given this number uh, 100,825,272,791 give or take uh, you know a few uh, spirits who have already passed their mortality and I also looked up uh, the total number of people or the population that's alive on the earth today in September of 2020 and was given 7.8 billion. So adding those two numbers together, uh, I got 108,625,272,791 people. And if we... Uh, look at that number, we can assume that that is the two-thirds of uh, spirits that uh, kept their first estate um, after the war in heaven. Um, and if we divide that number in half, uh, we get 54,312,636,391 as our estimated number of third um, of the host of heaven uh, that are now evil spirits. And if we take that number and divide it by the global, the total global population today, um, we get um, roughly, I uh, rounded up, but we get uh, seven evil spirits uh, per uh, mortal on earth and um, actually that number may be higher um, according to a, a few quotes that I have here um, author LDS author Stephen A. Kramer said the odds against the righteous are much greater than that for that is not the way Satan assigns his manpower because he is not allowed to tempt little children Satan's forces must be reserved to war against only those who are accountable. Um, and um, we can find that reference in Doctrine and Covenants section 29, verse 47. President Woodruff was quoted saying, Look at the number of devils we have around us. We have, I should say, 100 to every man, woman, and child. So that's quite an army uh, that's up against us today. This untitled parable uh, that I have 
right here gives us a better perspective on who and what we are up against. Um, it was given by President Smith in the Journal of Discourses, Volume 5. It says, A man traveling through the country came to a large city, very rich and splendid. He looked at it and said to his guide, This must be a very righteous people, for I can only see but one little devil in this great city. The guide replied, You do not understand, sir. This city is so perfectly given up to wickedness that it requires but one devil to keep them all in subjection. Traveling on a little farther, he came to a rugged path and saw an old man trying to get up the hillside, surrounded by seven great, big, coarse-looking devils. Why, says the traveler, this must be a tremendously wicked old man. See how many devils there are around him? This, replied the guide, is the only righteous man in the country, and there are seven of the biggest devils trying to turn him out of his path, and they all cannot do it. So why is there so much war recorded in the Book of Mormon? Why did Mormon include so much detail about the wars? With all the wonderful spiritual events that must have taken place, why would he use so much valuable space on the plates to record military intrigue and battle strategy? The scriptural accounts of war reveal a pattern. Kathleen S. McConkie said, Satan is waging an all-out war against truth and righteousness. His forces are everywhere, and we are involved in that war whether we like it or not. The danger is real, and the stakes are high. All around us, we see the battle casualties, their lives ruined and their souls scarred. If we expect to avoid becoming casualties ourselves, we desperately need the Lord's guidance, and there is no better place to find it than in the book of Scripture prepared specifically for our day, the Book of Mormon. Study the war chapters of the Book of Mormon. The scriptures contain countless examples of those who have won their wars, even in the midst of very hostile situations. Figuratively, all of us need to transform ourselves into modern Captain Moroni's in order to win the wars against evil. Elder Suarez continued saying, the war of good and against evil will continue throughout our lives since the adversary's purpose is to make all people as miserable as he is. Satan and his angels will try to shroud our thoughts and assert control by tempting us to sin. If they can, they will corrupt all that is good. Nevertheless, it is essential to understand that they will have power over us only if we allow it. In the Bible, book of Genesis, Joseph in Egypt had to run from Potiphar's wife when she tried to trap and frame him. Now, we can't always run from danger. Sometimes we have to be ready and able to fight. So how determined are you in your battle against the adversary? You are in an all-out war and cannot sit down in the middle of a firefight. So ask yourself, why are you fighting? In Mosiah chapter 20, verse 11, uh, we can find what motivated the people of Limhi in their battle. That verse says, And it came to pass that the people of Limhi began to drive the Lamanites before them, yet they were not half so numerous as the Lamanites, but they fought for their lives, and for their wives, and for their children. Therefore they exerted themselves. And like dragons did they fight. Now we need to be focused in our battles. Um, and we need to be careful not to lose that focus. In the war chapters, there was a man named Tiancum. And he was a man likened to Captain Moroni. However, um, 
he uh, was uh, slain after he had attempted to end the life of Amaron. Uh, in Alma chapter 62, we can read about that. Um, but we need to be careful because that anger may have uh, caused him to lose his focus and, and may have led to his death. In verse 36, it says, And it came to pass that Teancum, in his anger, did go forth into the camp of the Lamanites, and did let himself down over the walls of the city. And he went forth with a cord from place to place, insomuch that he did find the king, and he did cast a javelin at him, which did pierce him near the heart. But behold, the king did awaken his servants before he died, insomuch that they did pursue Teancum and slew him. Let's take a look at Captain Moroni, who is a model for spiritual survival. Um, he was first mentioned in Alma chapter 43, verses 16 and 17. And from uh, the early part of the war chapters, we learn that he was appointed chief captain of the Nephite armies at the young age of 25. He took all the command and government of their wars. He loved freedom and he used all manner of strategy held meetings of council, and sought direction from the prophet to protect the Nephites. <clears throat> During his uh, time as the chief captain of the Nephite armies, there took place 20 battles uh, that were recorded in the Book of Mormon, and seven of those battles were internal, uh, which became the central cause of their problems. Um, seven battles were won without a single loss of life, there were 13 battles between the Lamanites and the Nephites, and of those battles, they were victorious in 10 and only lost three. Who was Captain Moroni? We get a very good analysis and description about Captain Moroni from Alma chapter 48. Verse 11 starts out saying, Moroni was a strong and a mighty man, a man of perfect understanding, a man that did not delight in bloodshed, a man whose soul did joy in the liberty and freedom of his brethren from bondage and slavery. Verse 12 says, He was a man whose heart did swell with thanksgiving to his God for the many privileges and blessings which he bestowed upon his people, a man who did labor exceedingly for the welfare and safety of his people. In verse 13, it says, He was a man who was firm in the faith of Christ. He had sworn with an oath to defend his people his rights, his country, and his religion, even to the loss of his blood. Alma chapter 48 verse 16 says, It was their faith that God would make it known unto them whether they should go to defend themselves against their enemies, and by so doing, the Lord would deliver them. We also find out that Moroni did glory in preserving his people, yea, in keeping the commandments of God, yea, and resisting iniquity. Verse 17 says, If all men had been, and were, and ever would be, likened to Moroni, behold, the very powers of hell would have been shaken forever. Yea, the devil would never have power over the hearts of the children of men. And in the next chapter, Alma chapter 49, verse 11, we see just how powerful Moroni was that he actually had altered the management of affairs among the Nephites against their enemies, the Lamanites. So who were the Nephite armies? In Alma chapter 48, we read in verses 15 and 16, and this was their faith, that by so doing, God would prosper them in the land or in other words, if they were faithful in keeping the commandments of God, that he would prosper them in the land, yea, warn them to flee or to prepare for war according to their danger, and also that God would make it known unto them whether they should go to defend themselves against their enemies, and by so doing, the Lord would deliver them. So they believed God would prosper them in their efforts to protect and preserve their people by warning them uh, and 
helping them prepare specific to the present danger that they were experiencing. And then uh, third, he would tell them where to, defend, where to defend themselves. So this is a um, uh, review of each uh, war and battle that the Nephites faced. We first uh, f uh, learn of the battle with Zarahemna, uh, and that was the Zoramites with Amalekites uh, descent and become Lamanites. Zarahemna becomes their leader and desires to gain power over the Nephites. Moroni confronts them in battle and places them under covenant to go away in peace. Some reject the offer and Moroni's army defeats them. This uh, uh, battle was also uh, one that was uh, commenced internally. Um, then we have the first Kingmen battle. And this was another internal battle. Um, it was um, Amalickiah who conspires to be king. Moroni leads a political struggle and attack on Amalickiah who flees to Lamanites. Treason is punished by death. Few deny the covenant of freedom. In the first Lamanite invasion, the Lamanites invade in Amalickiah's absence, and not a single soul is lost on the Nephites. Nephites gain power over their enemies. The battle with Morianton uh, consists of Morianton dissenting um, uh, through a conflict with the city of Lehi concerning rights to the land. Teancum kills Morianton and peace is restored. The second Kingman battle uh, is where the Kingmen attempt political change and fail. The second Lamanite invasion is the Lamanites uh, capture multiple cities and Teancum attempts to halt their progress and assassinates Amalickiah. <clears throat> the Battle of Mulek um, in this battle, there is loss of life on both sides. Moroni uses strategy to retake Melek, and Jacob, a Lamanite, is killed. There are uh, Western battles, uh, which include the loss of Western cities due to, to more dissension, and the Nephites uh, are weak and in danger. Uh, and then come the stripling warriors to provide great hope. Um, afterwards, uh, the next battle is the Battle of Gid, uh, um, which involves the city and prisoners being retaken without bloodshed. Um, then, the first battle of Antipera, with Antipas and Helaman, um, who defeat a larger Lamanite army without losing any stripling warriors. Uh, the Nephite chief captains and soldiers are killed. Then we have the second battle of Antipera, where the city is retaken without bloodshed and the Lamanites flee. Afterwards, we have the siege of uh, Kumanai. Uh, the city is retaken without bloodshed. And then we have the battle of Kumanai. Lamanite prisoners overpower Gid, who is en route to Zarahemla. Gid returns and saves the army and city. Not a single soul of stripling warriors is lost, but 200 are wounded. Um, and then the Battle of Manti, Helaman, Git, and Tiamna retake city due to knowledge of the land. They draw out the Lamanites without loss of blood. Uh, the first battle of Nephiha, the city is lost because of conflict in the government, keeping provisions from being sent. And then the first battle of Zarahemla, Pacchus appointed king by the Kingman faction. He makes a pact with the Lamanites. Zarahemla falls to them, and Pahoran goes into exile. The Second Battle of Zarahemla. Kingman Rebellion is destroyed and legal government restored. Treason laws are enforced. The Battle en route to Nephiha. Lamanites prisoners are taken, and they covenant to become Ammonites. In the Second Battle of Nephiha, Moroni breaches the wall and lets in armies by night. No souls are lost. Lamanite prisoners join Ammonites. And lastly, the Battle of Moroni. Lamanites flee city of Lehi and other cities and come together into one army. 
Tiancum assassinates Amaron, Moroni attacks, Lamanites flee, and the war ends. So what caused internal Nephite battles? Alma chapter 50 verse 21 tells us, It has been their quarrelings and their contentions, yea, their murderings and their plunderings, their idolatry, their whoredoms, and their abominations, which were among themselves, which brought upon them their wars and their destructions. So we can see that it was contention, anger, greed, and lust, which did drive away God's spirit. So these problems caused this disconnect from God's spirit, and they became easy prey to their own struggles and bondage. So Make a covenant of peace and surrender your weapons of rebellion. Captain Moroni recognized the value of covenants. So let's see if we can learn about covenants and their value in our spiritual survival. What are covenants? In Moroni's time, between two parties, this was a binding agreement or an obligation. The Bible Dictionary says sometimes uh, denotes an agreement between persons or nations, and more often between God and man. The Church of Jesus Christ.org defines covenants as an agreement between God and man, but they do not act as equals in the agreement. God gives the conditions for the covenant, and men agree to do what he asks them to do. God then promises men certain blessings for their obedience. Principles and ordinances are received by covenant. Members of the church who make such covenants promise to honor them. For example, members covenant with the Lord at baptism and renew that covenant by partaking of the sacrament. They make further covenants in the temple. The Lord's people are a covenant people and are greatly blessed as they keep their covenants with the Lord. So um, we see in the war chapters of the Book of Mormon that there are at least seven recorded occasions Moroni commands others to make a covenant. Um, first, we have Zarahemna and the Lamanite armies. Now, the covenant conditions were to deliver up weapons of war or rebellion and depart in peace and come not again to war against the Nephites. The promise was that the Nephite armies would spread the lives of Zarahemna and the Lamanite armies. The second one is uh, the Nephites that were on the fence about Amalickiah. Their covenant conditions were to maintain the title upon the land to maintain their rights and religion. And their promise was God would bless them. The third one is the people of Morianton and their covenant conditions were to keep the peace with the people in the city of Lehi. And their promise was that they would be restored to their land. The fourth uh, that we see is uh, with the free men and their covenant conditions uh, were that um, of to maintain rights and privileges of religion by a free government. And their promise was that strength and was strength and blessings of God. The fifth uh, covenant that that we see in the war chapters. Uh, from Captain Moroni is with the Lamanite armies of Jacob, who was originally a Zoramite. Uh, their covenant conditions were to deliver up their weapons of war, and their promise was that the Nephites would forbear shedding their blood. Uh, the sixth is with the Nephites, uh, similar to the their free men uh, earlier. Their covenant conditions were to take up the sword in defense of their freedom. And their promise was that they would not come into bondage. And the seventh um, we see uh, is with the Lamanite armies in Nephiha. Their covenant conditions were to no more take up their weapons of war against the Nephites. And their promise was that they could dwell peacefully with the people of Ammon. So early on in the war chapters of the Book of Mormon, we see that uh, Zarahemna had a problem when uh, Captain Moroni had presented him with uh, uh, opportunity to invoke a covenant. In um, Alma chapter 44, verse 9, we see his response 
to Captain Ronai's offer. He says, we do not believe that it is God that has delivered us into your hands, but we believe that it is your cunning and that has preserved you. There obviously was no faith on Zarahemla's part. And as we relate his experience to our um, life today uh, with our covenants, we need to ask ourselves, do we lack faith in our covenants? And Captain Moroni's servant, in response to Zarahemna's um, refusal to, to accept those covenant conditions, said, um, Even as this scalp has fallen to the earth, which is the scalp of your chief, so shall ye fall to the earth, except ye deliver your weapons of war and depart with a covenant of peace. So the opportunity for decision to put away weapons of rebellion and continue in peace was that. Um, President Nelson, in a talk titled, Come Follow Me, said, do the spiritual work to find out for yourself, and please do it now. Time is running out. So like uh, Zarahemna was presented with a, an opportunity to decide, so are we. We have that opportunity to, de to decide right now. Uh, one covenant Moroni used to strengthen his efforts to maintain freedom and liberty was the title of liberty. And this served as a constant reminder to rally the Nephites to the cause of the Christians to maintain this purpose in their right in their land, rights, and religion, that the Lord God would bless them. In, uh, uh, let's see here, Alma chapter 46, verse 13, 16, and 20, we see uh, footnotes 13b and 20b, which lead to the topical guide reference of citizenship. Captain Moroni, at the young age of 25, had a great understanding of covenants. He recognized how they motivated his ancestors to act on their beliefs, and so he utilized them to secure peace and freedom from, for his people. So what title of citizenship can inspire us in our fight against sin and the adversary? Um, we see that citizenship um, is the relationship between an individual and a state to which the individual owes allegiance, and in turn is entitled to its protection. So if we owe our allegiance to God as his children, we are entitled to his spiritual protection, right? Is there a correlation between liberty and citizenship? Citizenship implies the status of freedom with accompanying responsibilities, according to Britannica.com. Covenants mark the path back to God, making us free. So um, the study of our covenants will improve our behavior. I believe that if we understand our covenants like Moroni did, we will improve our response to these challenges we face in this life on earth. What covenants can I make that will ensure spiritual safety in the battle with sin? Well, uh, as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, there are several covenants that we make. First is the baptismal covenant. And then for men who obtain uh, the priesthood and are ordained um, to the Melchizedek priesthood, uh, there is the oath and covenant of the priesthood. And then in the temple, we, we uh, take on ourselves a covenant in the temple endowment and also the uh, marriage covenant which is a new and everlasting covenant. President Boyd K. Packer said, true doctrine understood changes attitudes and behavior. The study of the doctrines of the gospel will improve behavior quicker than a study of behavior will improve behavior. So if we want to improve in our efforts to overcome our sins and mistakes, we must understand our covenants. In uh, Alma chapter 46, verse 36, we see um, it says, 
And it came to pass also that he caused the title of liberty to be hoisted upon every tower, which was in all the land, which was possessed by the Nephites. And thus Moroni planted the standard of liberty among the Nephites. So how can we, like Captain Moroni, uh, raise our covenants in every part of our life? As President Nelson mentioned, we must decide now. President Monson, back in October 2010, said decisions are constantly before us. To make them wisely, courage is needed. The courage to say no. The courage to say yes. Decisions do determine destiny. I plead with you to make a determination right here, right now, not to deviate from the path which will lead to our goal, eternal life with our Father in heaven. In Alma chapter 24, verse 19, we see uh, with the people of Ammon that they were firm and would suffer even unto death rather than commit sin. And now this word firm means strongly felt and unlikely to change in a resolute and determined manner. Joshua 24, verse 15 says, Choose you this day whom ye will serve. And um, President Uchtdorf, in a conference talk back in October 2013, said, Brethren, there may be times in our lives when rising up and continuing on may seem beyond our own ability. That day on a snow-covered slope, I learned something. Even when we think we cannot rise up, there is still hope. And sometimes we just need someone to look us in the eyes, take our hand and say, you can do it now. And if I could look you in the eyes, I would echo Elder Uchtdorf's, or at this time, President Uchtdorf's statement. You can do it now. In Alma chapter 52, it says in verse 19, And in the commencement of the twenty and eighth year, Moroni and Teancum and many of the chief captains held a council of war, what they should do to cause the Lamanites to come out against them to battle, or that they might be, by some means flatter them out of their strongholds, that they might gain advantage over them and take again the city of Mulek. So uh, we need to look for resources and opportunities to counsel with a trusted friend, family member, and even a uh, licensed professional therapist or church leader when and where appropriate. Elder Neil A. Maxwell said, Act, my brothers and sisters, for once the soul is tilted toward belief, and once there is even a desire to believe, then marvelous things begin to happen. Once one leaves the porch and comes inside the church, then one not only hears the music more clearly, he becomes a part of it. Act now, so that a thousand years from now, when you look back at this moment, you can say, this was a moment that mattered. This was a day of determination. The truth is that not yet usually means never. So let's look at Captain Moroni's skills as described in the war chapters. As I read over these, try to think of skills you may need to develop in your spiritual battles. Some of these skills uh, include the, uh, him using visible symbols to remind declare loyalty and build morale, holding group rallies to strengthen resolve, developing hand-to-hand -hand battle skill, building clever defensive structures, preaching to build faith and unity, wisely deploying key leaders, using peacetime to secure strategic perimeter with forces as well as settlements, Leveraging previous success to recruit during peacetime. And building political and popular support before taking on enemies. Creatively solving, creatively solving problems and developing tactics. And deploying forces strategically. Now I want to focus on um, a few of these um, that are in bold uh, using visible symbols. Building defensive structures and deploying key leaders. Captain Moroni's defenses um, were mentioned in Alma chapter 48. 
we read uh, that uh, it started with erecting small forts or places of resort, throwing up banks of earth round about to enclose his armies, building walls of stone to encircle them about, round about their cities and the borders of their lands, yea, all round about the land. And in the weakest fortifications, he did place the greater number of men. Let's look at defense number one, small forts, places of resort, and earth. Now the purpose of banks of earth is to put distance between us and the enemy. Small forts and places of resort could be simple and short in duration activities that you can do or places you can go during moments of duress. This is a lot of work, but if you will do it well enough, the earth and forts will be so high that the enemy will not cast their stones and their arrows at them that they might take effect. So what are your small forts, places of resort, or earth? Defense number two, walls of stone. Now stone is symbolic in meaning. Christ is the stone. He is the rock of our salvation. He is the cornerstone of the church. He is referred to as a rock and fortress. Christ refers to himself as the rock of heaven. First line of defense in Moroni's defensive plan. Moroni surrounded the entire cities and borders of the land with stone walls. So as we look at this picture, we see uh, it gives us a, a better visual on how Christ is our rock. So what do you need to do to bring Christ closely into your life that you would benefit from his full defense against the assaults that will come? Defense number three, men and women. Moroni understood that no matter how much earth and stone he used, there would be vulnerable areas in the cities, easier places for the enemy to approach. There were, for example, entrances to the cities through which people could come and go during times of peace. These were access points for Amalekias hosts as well. So Moroni placed his most powerful warriors in these places to protect the vulnerable. And in a uh, conference talk by Elder Holland uh, referring to uh, ministering, he shares a, uh, an experience uh, of, a, um, of two friends and, and one um, who went to the rescue of another. He said, in this story is John Manning, home teacher extraordinaire. I frankly don't know on what schedule John and his junior companion made visits to the Russell home or what message was given when they got there or how they reported the experience. What I do know is that last spring, Brother Manning reached down and picked Troy Russell up off the tragedy of that driveway just as he were picking up little Austin himself. Like the home teacher or watchman or brother in the gospel, he was supposed to be. John simply took over the priesthood care and keeping of Troy Russell. So who are your most faithful allies? Alma 43 gives us some detail about their armor and what they were protecting. In uh, verse 38, it says, while on the other hand, there was now and then a man fell among the Nephites by their swords and the loss of blood, they being shielded from the more vital parts of the body, or the more vital parts of the body being shielded from the strokes of the Lamanites by their breastplates and their arm shields and their head plates. And thus the Nephites did carry on the work of death among the Lamanites. So what did they try to protect as vital parts? With the breastplate, they were protecting the heart. The head plate, they were protecting the brain and the arm shield was protecting their limbs. And we can see how um, as we put on our spiritual armor, we can protect our feelings, thoughts, and actions. So what are we doing to maintain control and safeguard our feelings, thoughts, and actions? 
How are we shielding these vital parts from the adversary and his army? Building fortifications. The Nephite cities of Ammonihah and Noah were subjected to destruction by the Lamanite armies in the past, but because of the instruction of Captain Moroni, they had been rebuilt in part and were fortified to the astonishment of the Lamanites, who became fearful and clueless as to how to overtake these cities that had once been weak, but now were strong. According to Albert Einstein, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. In verse 8 and 23 of chapter 49 in Alma, it says, But behold, to their uttermost astonishment, they were prepared for them in a manner which never had been known among the children of Lehi. Now they were prepared for the Lamanites to battle after the manner of the instructions of Moroni, Thus the Nephites had all power over their enemies, and thus the Lamanites did attempt to destroy the Nephites until their chief captains were all slain. Yea, and more than a thousand of the Lamanites were slain, while on the other hand, there was not a single soul of the Nephites which was slain. So what specific and different ways can you fortify your life to be better prepared for the attacks of the adversary? Moroni caused that the Lamanite prisoners should commence laboring and digging a ditch round about Bountiful. He understood it was easy to guard them while at their labor. Now we're going to talk about the fortification of work. Uh, from Captain Moroni's example, we learn that we must work to exhaust temptation and develop a strategy to deal with the forces of temptation. Alma chapter 38, verse 12 says, See that ye refrain from idleness. The Nephites and Captain Moroni understood this. In 2 Nephi chapter 5, verse 17, it says, And it came to pass that I, Nephi, did cause my people to be industrious and to labor with their hands. The Book of Mormon describes the Lamanites as um, a very indolent people, uh, lazy and slothful. But um, as the Book of Mormon progresses uh, towards the end, we see that they were able to understand the, the concept of um, industry and, and laboring with their hands. In Alma chapter 62, verses 27 to 29, it says, Now it came to pass that many of the Lamanites that were prisoners were desirous to join the people of Ammon and become a free people. And it came to pass that as many as were desirous unto them it was granted according to their desires. Therefore, all the prisoners of the Lamanites did join the people of Ammon and did begin to labor exceedingly, tilling the ground, raising all manner of grain, and flocks and herds of every kind. And thus were the Nephites relieved from a great burden, yea, insomuch that they were relieved from all the prisoners of the Lamanites. President Thomas S. Monson said, Work will win when wishy-washy wishing won't. So what does your daily routine and schedule look like? What things do you enjoy doing that are productive and taxing? Now we come to the fortification of gratitude. Gratitude is a powerful way of generating positive emotions now intentionally looking for the interim miracles in the war adds to your faith and faith enables patience which is the essence of character gratitude is the best inoculation against despair and impatience so we must look for god's hand in our life daily and then comes the fortification of response. Elder Bednar said in a training uh, with church members in Europe in September 2011, we are agents who can act and that affects everything in terms of how we live the gospel in our daily lives. It affects how we pray, how we study the scriptures, how we worship, 
There is a difference when one goes to a sacrament meeting essentially as an object waiting to be acted upon. Feed me. Give me something. As opposed to worshiping in sacrament meeting as an agent where we are acting, asking, seeking, and knocking. Alma 60 verse 15 says, For were it not for the wickedness which first commenced at our head, we could have withstood our enemies, that they could have gained no power over us. So, as we can see from that verse, you can predict lost battles by watching what happens in your head. And we must first learn to see danger signs far in advance, and then second, respond in a way that rejects the temptations. Let's talk about spiritual offensive weapons. Alma chapter 43 verses 18 and 19 said, And it came to pass that he met the Lamanites in the borders of Jershon, and his people were armed with swords and with scimitars and all manner of weapons of war. And when the armies of the Lamanites saw that the people of Nephi, or that Moroni, had prepared his people with breastplates and with arm shields, yea, and also shields to defend their heads, and also they were dressed with thick clothing. Uh, weapon of repentance. President Nelson talked about this weapon when he said, Repentance is the key to avoiding misery inflicted by traps of the adversary. We've also been counseled to repent daily. Have we been doing that? How can we plan and prepare to do that moving forward? This includes prayer and accountability. Weapon of Scriptures. President Monson said, We live in a time of great trouble and wickedness. What will protect us from the sin and evil so prevalent in the world today? I maintain that a strong testimony of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and of his gospel will help see us through to safety. If you are not reading the Book of Mormon each day, please do so. If you will read it prayerfully and with a sincere desire to know the truth, the Holy Ghost will manifest its truth to you. And President Nelson said in October 2017, I promise that as you daily immerse yourself in the Book of Mormon, you can be immunized against the evils of the day. Let's look at the weapon of the priesthood. President James E. Faust in October 2000, in a talk titled The Enemy Within said, Each of us needs to train ourselves to be bold, disciplined, and loyal men of the priesthood who are prepared with the proper weapons to fight against evil and to win. Brethren, we can shield ourselves against the enemy within each of us by using the protective mantle of the priesthood of God. Individually, we need to put the great powers of the holy priesthood to work in our lives. Let's look at the weapon of personal revelation. Um, we see in the Book of Mormon that this was um, a character trait of those who were appointed as chief captains over Nephite armies. In 3rd Nephi chapter 3 verse 19 it says, now it was the custom among all the Nephites to appoint for their chief captains, save it were in their times of wickedness, someone that had the spirit of revelation and also prophecy. President Nelson said in April 2018, I urge you to stretch beyond your current spiritual ability to receive personal revelation. If we are to have any hope of sifting through the myriad of voices and the philosophies of men that attack truth, we must learn to receive revelation, but in coming days, it will not be possible to survive spiritually without the guiding, directing, comforting, and constant influence of the Holy Ghost. Now we must use the shield of Christ's atonement. In Alma chapter 44, verse 5, it says, In the name of that all-powerful God who has strengthened our arms, that we have gained power over you. Elder Tadar Callister said, 
We can be saved only because the Savior, through his atonement, mercifully provides us with a spiritual parachute of sorts. If we have faith in Jesus Christ and repent, meaning we do our part and pull the ripcord, then the protective powers of the Savior are unleashed on our behalf and we can land spiritually unharmed. We must remember the Lord and be victorious. In Alma chapter 55, verse 31, it says, But behold, the Nephites were not slow to remember the Lord their God in this time, their time of affliction. They could not be taken in their snares. Yea, they would not partake of their wine, save they had first given to some of the Lamanite prisoners. And in Alma chapter 62, it says in verse 49, 50, and 51, but notwithstanding their riches, or their strength, or their prosperity, they were not lifted up in the pride of their eyes. Neither were they slow to remember the Lord their God, but they did humble themselves exceedingly before him. Yea, they did remember how great things the Lord had done for them, that he had delivered them from death, and from bonds, and from prisons, and from all manner of afflictions. And he had delivered them out of the hands of their enemies, and they did pray unto the Lord their God continually, insomuch that the Lord did bless them according to his word, so that they did wax strong and prosper in the land. So remembering the Lord in our time of affliction will help keep us victorious. When does the battle end for us? It may be at different times for you and me. Maybe it's in this life. Are we in the battle of addiction or selfishness? Maybe not until after this life. In the end, you may sustain some injuries in your spiritual battles, but one thing is certain. That is that Christ has already gained the victory. It is through his atonement that we can be healed, enabled, and strengthened to press forward. If we trust in the Savior and follow him, he will reward you in your struggle to victory. In Alma chapter 62, verse 43, we see after years of conflict and battle to defend and protect the Nephites, Captain Moroni retired to his own house that he might spend the remainder of his days in peace. Our battle continues and we keep fighting, looking forward to the time when Christ returns. In that day, I hope we will be able to spend the remainder of our days in this life or the next, in peace, as did Captain Moroni. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.